If Michael Jordan was Batman and Scottie Pippen was Robin, then Dennis Rodman was the Joker. That is, assuming the Joker decided to stop being Batman's arch nemesis and start being Batman's ally and friend, which is essentially what Rodman did. After all, he was originally part of the notorious Bad Boys Detroit Pistons team that eliminated Jordan's Bulls from the playoffs three years in a row. Dennis Rodman, aka The Worm, was a tireless competitor, a tenacious defender, and one of the greatest rebounders the game has ever seen. He was the kind of player who could grab 20 rebounds in a game, score zero points, and not be fussed. And every team needs a player like that. Most people knew him, though, for his dyed hair, his tattoos, his piercings, and, of course, his wild antics. And here are five of his wildest. Number five. He starred in a martial arts movie with Jean-Claude Van Damme and Mickey Rourke called Double Team. The film currently has an 11% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. At number four. He once had a brief romance with Madonna, who reportedly offered to pay him $20 million to impregnate her so she could have babies with Dennis Rodman's DNA. Sidebar, if you're too young to know who Madonna is, put Taylor Swift, Beyonce and Lady Gaga together, multiply their collective influence by 10, and you're about halfway to what Madonna's influence was when she was in her prime. She's the queen of pop. Number three, Dennis Rodman did a whole lot of headbutting. He headbutted opposing players, he headbutted an opposing team's mascot. He was even ejected from a game for headbutting a referee. Not to mention, he was also fined and suspended for kicking a cameraman in the groin. <laughs> Number two, he left the Bulls in the middle of a final series in order to participate in a world championship wrestling match with Hulk Hogan. Note, he did make it back for game three and the Bulls went on to win the title in six. And number one, he showed up to his own book signing in full makeup and wedding dress, announcing that he was marrying himself. Of course, it wasn't a real wedding, but the publicity and the book sales that followed, they were very real. And this is all without even mentioning the infamous mid-season Vegas vacation that was covered in episodes three and four of The Last Dance. The thing is, though, being Dennis Rodman wasn't all fun and games. We might look back on him as a bit of a court jester, as this wild, uninhibited party animal, but in reality he was, and by his own admission still is, a broken man with a tortured soul. He struggles with anxiety and has been in and out of rehab numerous times for alcoholism. He's been married three times and divorced three times. His relationships always marred by affairs and accusations of abuse. Despite longing to be the father he himself never had, his kids have largely grown up without him. And he's been rescued from attempting suicide numerous times, once in the parking lot of the arena in Detroit. So as you can imagine, though every NBA team would have loved Dennis Rodman's rebounding, there weren't many teams that were actually willing to sign him because they all knew the distractions and baggage that would come with him. Rodman's time with the Pistons fizzled out after the team made several key personnel changes. His time with the Spurs ended after he refused to cooperate with the coach, with his teammates and with management. His time with the Lakers lasted only 23 games and his time with the Mavericks lasted only 12, though it is worth pointing out that in those 12 games, he still managed to earn six technical fouls, two ejections, and one suspension. But in 1995, Rodman joined the Bulls for three seasons, and he describes those three seasons as the best years of his life, personally as well as professionally. What worked in Chicago that didn't seem to work anywhere else. Was it that they paid him more? No, they didn't. Was it that they lowered their expectations of him? Well, no, if anything, they raised their expectations. Was it that he had Michael Jordan as his teammate? That kind of hurt, but no, that wasn't it either. The answer is actually much simpler. According to Rodman himself, 
He thrived in Chicago because in Chicago, they accepted him. Listen to how he describes it in his own words. He says, The three years I was in Chicago were probably the most incredible three years that I've had as a human being. I don't ever think I was loved as much as I was loved all over the place in Chicago, the city, the team. I mean, the city of Chicago embraced me, gave me the opportunity to be myself and do what I do, give a rock star performance on the court, give a rock star performance off the court. I did everything in the book while I was playing with Chicago. They let me be myself, an independent, free, black MFA. It was just unreal. Acceptance is powerful. It can change a person, bring out the best in a person. When a person doesn't feel accepted, they'll either fight to the death to get it, or they'll give up altogether and live like they never wanted it. But when a person feels accepted, when a person is accepted, they don't have to waste their energy proving that they're in or proving that they're out. They're free to get on with life in all honesty and openness and love. And that's when the real growth happens. That's when you'll see them at their best. One of the things I find most impressive about Jesus was that he accepted absolutely everyone, no matter who they were or what the rest of society thought of them. And in fact, Jesus was so famous for hanging out with the kinds of people society had rejected that it became a recurring criticism of him. Both Matthew and Luke's Gospels record Jesus' detractors as starting a rumor about him saying, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Well, at least they got the last part right. Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And we saw this in today's reading, which described Jesus' encounter with a guy named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a social outcast. He was a tax collector, a chief tax collector, in fact. And in Jesus' day, tax collectors were thought to be liars and cheats, which by most accounts, they were. But not only that, tax collectors were seen as traitors, They were Jews who collected taxes off other Jews on behalf of the Romans, Israel's first century foreign oppressors. So as you can imagine, everyone absolutely hated their guts and avoided them at all costs. Everyone, that is, except for Jesus. Because when Jesus saw Zacchaeus, he didn't avoid him and he didn't reject him. He didn't turn to the people next to him and say, oh, there goes another filthy tax collector. Lying, cheating, scum, am I right? When Jesus saw Zacchaeus, he cut through the crowd, he went right up to the tree Zacchaeus was hiding in, and he said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. When Jesus saw Zacchaeus, he invited himself over to Zacchaeus' home. So he wants to eat with him which in the first century you only really did with those you considered social and religious equals. So Jesus accepted Zacchaeus. And as a result, Zacchaeus' whole life changed. Listen to what he says in verse 8. Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Jesus' acceptance made all the difference to Zacchaeus' life just as the Chicago Bulls acceptance made all the difference to Dennis Rodman's life. But notice how in both cases, the acceptance is what inspires the change, not the other way around. It's not as though Zacchaeus had to give half his possessions to the poor and pay back those he'd cheated in order for Jesus to accept him, but rather it's because Jesus accepted him that Zacchaeus wanted to do that stuff. And it's not as though Dennis Rodman had to win three championships with the Bulls in order to gain their love and acceptance. But rather, it's because the Bulls gave their love and acceptance that Rodman was motivated to go out and help them win. You see, a lot of people think that the Christian faith is about getting your act together, pulling your socks up, trying to be a better person in order to gain God's approval. In other words, a lot of people think that in Christianity change leads to acceptance. But when you read the Bible, you'll find that actually it's the other way around. Acceptance is what leads to change. The Bible rings with the message that in Jesus, God accepts you for who you are. He says, come to me as you are. Come and dine with me. I have a place prepared at the table just for you. 
The Christian faith is not about getting your act together. It's about recognizing that in Jesus, God came to accept the unacceptable, and that includes you and me. And it also includes Dennis Rodman. You might have missed it, but a few months before the last dance, ESPN released a 30 for 30 documentary about Rodman called For Better or Worse, which Rodman said he hoped would help people understand him a little better. He said, and I quote, I think after watching the film, they're going to look at me and say, wow, he didn't want no money. He didn't want no fame. He didn't want anything. He just wanted someone to take care of him and love him. Of course, the irony is, that's all his own children want from him. And so far, he's been unable to give it to them. There's a really moving part in the documentary where Rodman's oldest daughter, Alexis, who has only seen her father intermittently throughout her life, turns to the camera and says, my father is a really beautiful person. And I don't know about you, but I long for Dennis Rodman to hear those words to know that in spite of all his failures as a father, his daughter loves and accepts him and wants him, needs him to be a part of her life. And I long for that knowledge to change everything for him. At the same time, I also long for you to hear the words of Jesus, to know that in spite of all your flaws and failures, all your struggles and shame, your Heavenly Father loves and accepts you. And I long for that knowledge to change everything for you. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that when no one else does, you see us as we really are. And yet you still love us. We ask that today you would give us the strength, the courage, the humility to take up your invitation to come to you as we are with all our faults and failures, all our guilt and shame, all our doubts and questions, that we might dine with you, that we might sit at the place at the table you've prepared just for us, that by the blood of Jesus and the enabling of your spirit, we might know the transforming power of your acceptance. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.